the very idea that security is an enabler, I think, is a relatively new thing, right? <laughs> We're only now realizing that that has to be the case. Mm -hmm. At a certain point, you start to wonder, where does my job start and where does it stop? I think without a very collaborative team, things will either just not get done or there's extreme turf wars. You can't just go from conflict straight to collaboration. Like, let's do a project together. Like, yes. I'm not working with That's you, are right. you kidding me? And now I have to balance out my desire to enable the business with my need to also protect the business. My whole life, I've kind of felt like an outcast in some way. And when I joined cybersecurity, it was still the same because I was the person that was against everybody else. I was against all the departments in the organization. But I think things are changing slowly. Security is getting a new lens, new perspective. So we had to bring you in, Lenny, because you've been a chief security officer time and time again. You've worked with product, but I gotta ask, do you feel like today is a security versus everyone? Maybe, depends on the environment. <laughs> maybe, maybe it's just you. <laughs> but you're right in that, as the saying goes, security has been the department of no. Mm -hmm. And we were often in the position to have to deny people. They want to do all these exciting things. And we always get on their way, just step aside. That's yeah. what people thought. Yeah. And I think that realistically created a lot of conflict. I think as an industry, we have grown, matured, and realized that if we're gonna be helping the business move forward, then we need to find a way to say yes, we need to find a way to collaborate. Yes, we're protecting organizations against risk, but doing so, perhaps yes, in a less adversarial way. Yeah, I would say that the, one of the classic sort of clashings people talk about is IT versus security, right? They say there might be different priorities. IT wants to make sure things are connected and up, and security wants to keep things safe. And sometimes there can be a little bit of a competition there. In your role, you're doing both sides of the house. Do you like argue with yourself in the mirror when it comes to like making sure things are up versus things that are safe? Or how, how do you reconcile the difference between IT and security? Yeah, I, I argue with myself all the time. <laughs> Hopefully not out loud. And in my current role, I'm a CISO of Axonius, but I also have CIO responsibilities which means that, yes, I'm responsible for how we use cloud infrastructure, how our corporate IT enables the company to succeed, and how we're protecting the company from risk and security threats. So it's tough. It's tough when the role of a security officer and the information officer are combined in one head. Because sometimes I want to just say, let's do it. This technology is clearly exciting. Here's a brand new startup is gonna allow our business users to move forward more quickly. It's gonna enable all these scenarios where we as a business will be more successful if we embrace this brand new cutting edge product from a startup that no one's ever heard of. Mm -hmm. And then the security person in me thinks about risk. Yep. And inevitably, I tend to think about all the ways in which things can go wrong. And I'm thinking, wait a second, it's a startup. To what extent are we now dependent on them not having a breach? Mm -hmm. How are we protecting ourselves against that third-party risk? And now I have to balance out my desire to enable the business with my need to also protect the business. Right. And it's tough. For me, my desire to enable the business came much later in my career. When I first got into cybersecurity, I wanted to be a hacker and I wanted to break into everything or even find the hackers and kick them out. But then I started to realize that security is a business enabler. It's not just something that you do for fun. It's not just something that can help protect the organization, but it can help scale and optimize the organization. But from your perspective, what areas or departments, organizations within companies do you find security helping most besides just IT? And the very idea that security is an enabler, I think, is a relatively new thing, right? <laughs> We're only now realizing that that has to be the case. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we're just a burden, and people tend to find ways around burdens. So if we want people in the organization to come to us, they need to see that we're helping them in some way. Mm -hmm. So how 
Are we helping various departments? We work a lot with R&D. Mm -hmm. Our company builds a product, a software product. And so we help R&D make smarter decisions about how they can implement certain capabilities so that we can deliver the functionality that customers want, but also protect the information that our product is processing. So by advising developers in safe, practical ways in which they can implement code, I hope we're being helpful. But the key there is practical advice. In our case, I believe one of the reasons why we've built a strong application security capability is that our engineers that work with software developers, our security engineers, Mm -hmm. come primarily from software development background. And so they know how to think the way that a software engineer does. And this way, they are welcome to be a part of the discussion. They can add value. Mm -hmm. But we also work, of course, with many other departments, sales, HR, or the people team, various other organizations where it's not practical for us to hire a security engineer who was also in charge of HR, who was also an attorney, who was also a seller. And so the people that we bring in into the security team, we cannot expect them to have had similar roles in the past. So what's left? We need to hire people who know how to empathize Mm -hmm. with our stakeholders, who can think through their eyes, Mm -hmm. understand the world, according to their needs, and thus hopefully speak on their terms and find how to be helpful in their context. Yeah, empathy is huge. Obviously, with you being in both roles for information and for security, it's easy to empathize, it's you. But when you look at other organizations, there's a lead for IT, there's a lead for security. How would you recommend they build their relationship in order to get the two orgs to work together? You said it earlier, it's tough. It's tough because IT is all about make the system run, prevent an outage, or react to downtime as quickly as possible. Security is all about, oh, hold on a second. Mm -hmm. Is this safe? Are we taking on undue risk? What are some of the threats we might need to anticipate? Mm -hmm. And I think at a high level, the way for IT and security to collaborate is to start by thinking about common goals, shared objectives. Why are we here? Mm -hmm. We're here because we work for the same company, which means that we have an interest in the company to succeed. Let's acknowledge that we play slightly different roles. That's why we're hired. We have the right background. We have the right expertise. But ultimately, we're here for the company to succeed. For that conversation between IT and security to be fruitful, the participants need to actually understand what does it mean for the company to succeed. It's it's easy enough to say that phrase. I just said it twice in the last minute. Mm -hmm. But what does it actually mean? It depends on the organization. Right. In one case, for the company to succeed, it needs to manufacture a lot of gadgets as cheaply as possible. Maybe that's its competitive edge. It Mm -hmm. knows how to keep its cost low and production volume high. That's one way to talk about success in that particular organization. In another case, maybe the competitive edge of the company is high-end, highly luxurious products that people are willing to pay a premium for. Again, what does that mean for IT and security? How Mm -hmm. can they enable for those objectives to be reached? What I'm saying is that whether you're talking about IT teams or security teams, we now need to have at least the individuals running those organizations thinking not just about their direct area of responsibility, but also about the broader business context of the organization, because that's the only way to find a common objective Mm -hmm. around which to rally and say, yes, we have to have some differences, and Mm -hmm. that's okay. We thrive in diversity, Mm -hmm. but how do we collaborate on that specific business objective? Uh, We need to have people who understand that. How do you inspire that getting out of that myopic view of like, this is my uh, area of operation and really like look at the big picture as a business? I think people are naturally, if not already, will be drawn towards going outside of their silo because if all you're doing day in and day out is protecting your turf, that sounds very stressful. It does. Although, granted, I am a security person who likes protecting my own turf, (laughs) but I think of that in terms of protecting my networks, my applications, my information. Mm -hmm. But if all I'm doing is making sure that I'm the only one who makes decisions and nobody else can weigh in and I only optimize for my own direct personal objectives, that's just not a good way to to live, frankly. It sounds like you're doing too much work. Mm -hmm. And so I think people naturally will find that it's easier to work with others when you go outside of your silo, when you understand the other person's perspective, when you understand something about the other person's job. And I think a lot of 
security and IT professionals have already discovered that, and others are probably in the process of realizing that that's the best way to work, the easiest way to work, and perhaps the more gratifying way to work. It's a slippery slope because we, in security, we like to follow frameworks. We like to use acronyms and, and methodologies, philosophies. One that's going around a lot right now is zero trust. Trust nothing. Assume breach. Verify every access request that's out there. And I think that's a great philosophy for security and organizations to follow, but what are other team members thinking when they're onboarding new devices, new applications? When you think about IT, they're not thinking, I'm assuming breach when adopting a new SaaS application. They're mm -hmm. thinking, I trust this application, I trust this vendor because I just signed a contract mm -hmm. with them. So I think you know we're almost finding ourselves in this weird situation by adopting these ideas and philosophies like zero trust, but the organization not culturally changing to adopt the philosophy. Yeah, that's a big deal. Um, because when security professionals hear, I don't trust anyone, to us, that's just second nature. We all nod mm -hmm. our heads and say, yeah, that's the way to perfect. live. Yeah, yeah, perfect, exactly <laughs> what I wanted. But when out, people outside of security hear zero trust, they, see, they, they, they hear, you don't trust me. You don't trust my decision to onboard that vendor. You don't trust my ability to write code. You don't trust my reason for requesting that somebody has certain permissions. You're second guessing me. You're undermining me. And those are all very negative reactions. Mm -hmm. And I think that means that we got to be careful about the language that we use. Mm -hmm. And it's okay to use certain jargon among people who understand it. And we need to be mindful, as you just suggested, of how other people hear our words and uh, sometimes that means having to clarify. For example, imagine you're processing an access request. Such and such developer needs access to this system. A security team oftentimes will ask, oh, sure, why do you need it? We need to find a way of asking that question without making the other person feel like you're, you're distrusting them. Right. And sometimes we need to take time to explain that the reason why I'm asking for this is because oftentimes our auditors will ask us for a justification. When, when all else fails, just blame the auditors. <laughs> Sometimes we need to say, hey, my role here is just to make sure that we don't make any rash decisions or, or something mm -hmm. like that. Right. And I've learned the hard way that the tone of your questioning of somebody mm -hmm. makes a whole lot of difference beyond the words themselves. It does. When you spent a lot of time in security architecture, I'm sure you worked with a lot of VPs of engineering or VPs of IT, and you have to put your solutions in their space, in their area of operation. What are some of the good and bad situations you found yourself in working with other folks? Well, as an architect, you have to practice a little bit of diplomacy and try to see both sides, not get in the middle of anything. But, you know, sometimes you have to recommend against a bad idea or against an idea that's not going to be ideal for an organization. And I will find myself doing that all the time. A lot of the times when people are brainstorming, the first idea is not the best. The second, not the best. But you have to keep on iterating over and over again. And I think with time not being on many people's side, you just cling to the first idea a lot of times. And... That's how we find ourselves in a, in a hard place to get out of acquiring tech debt. You always have to pay it back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or, or you hope that you're not around to pay that debt and, and the next guy <laughs> yeah. behind you is going to be paying that debt. I think a lot of decisions are made that way. Perhaps. Right. Mm -hmm. My mom didn't actually know that I was going to be born with a birth defect. It used to bother me quite a bit. She is just like you guys. The message of control and complexity doesn't just apply to one subject in life. That is a universal truth. When a challenge feels too big, break it down to the parts that you can control. Let's go from talking about the relationship between security and IT and go to a, a different business unit, right? We got to go to where the money is. We got to go to the finance organization and security. The solutions we're buying cost a lot of money. And I'm sure that CFO is really watching that bottom line, like, oh, what's going on here? Maybe it's a new CFO that really is starting to get acclimated to security. And now they're seeing like solutions that are costing millions of dollars over multiple years. And they're like, whoa, what is going on here? What has been your experience with working with finance and making sure that Everything is copacetic with them while ensuring that you're still covering all the needs that you have for the security program. 
it just requires a lot of work and a lot of education. You have to assume that if you simply say, here's a, a product I want to buy, here's how much it costs, people will be surprised. You know, it's always easy to underestimate how much things cost when you're not a part of that, that particular silo. Yeah. In, in anything, in anything. Again, because we're not in that world. We don't know right. what's normal. We also don't know the value to the organization. Mm -hmm. So you have to assume that when you submit a budget request, you have to justify the value. Right. And that can be frustrating sometimes. In part because I think, well, I'm not going to talk about security executives in general. I'll just talk about myself. Mm -hmm. But sometimes I see other executives in other disciplines submitting their requests, and they seem to be getting approvals right away. Well, I have to fight extra hard to justify myself. Right. Why? Well, maybe it's just me. But it could also be the fact that other disciplines have been around for longer. That's it. And when marketing submits a request, the finance team already knows yeah. how to evaluate it. Mm -hmm. HR, software development, and frankly, security officers are new to the executive table. And that is why, like it or not, we have to work harder than others to, first of all, justify our presence at the table, mm -hmm. but also educate our peers and other stakeholders about what we're doing and how much things cost. So talk us through it, because security technology is expensive. Mm -hmm. Security professionals are expensive. We hear about the great resignation, people leaving their job to work remote, but to also get a pay raise. So how would you justify it to a CFO if They've never worked in the security or technology space. Well, maybe let, let's start by understanding whom do you need to convince. <laughs> and yes, the CFO is often a part of the discussion, but let's not assume that that's the only party. Right. And in some cases, maybe that's not the party at all that is the decision maker. It depends right. on the company. It depends on the technology, the service, the, the people. Sometimes you need to persuade, I don't know, the, the, the chief people officer or the CEO. Mm -hmm. uh, but regardless, so, so start by understanding who needs to be persuaded. Mm -hmm. Are they supportive or are they likely to be concerned? And depending on who is involved, you would need to approach the situation a bit differently. It'll involve educating them, but in many cases, they just don't care about being educated. You know, they're all, they, they got their own problems. They don't want to hear mm -hmm. about your problems. So sometimes you'll see, you'll hear that people really lean into your explanation. Sometimes they're just going to say, look, just, just tell me, what's the bottom line? Why do I need it? How much is it going to cost? Ultimately, for your request to be approved, it needs to be linked to a business objective. Yep. We talked about business objectives earlier, and this is how I like to pose my budgetary requests. Here's what I'm looking to get funding for. Why do I need it? Mm -hmm. Whatever it is, I'm asking for money to fund people, to fund technology. I need to link it to a business objective. And this way, the conversation shifts from, why do you need this, right. to, is this sufficient? Can we get by with the existing resources? Is that really how much it's going to cost? And, and those are slightly more constructive, deeper questions than, where did this come from? When you think about what's going on today, right, you talked about the great resignation, folks are worried about economic downturn, and there might be some pressure on leaders, security leaders, to minimize how much they're spending every year. And so they might have to fight tooth and nail to say, this is why we need this, this is why we need that. How would you recommend a leader go into those conversations? Is it data? Is it numbers? Is it dollars and cents that you would go to the either the CEO or CFO when you're having those conversations? Or is there other metrics that you could use to justify the cost of a solution. So we already talked about linking your request to some business objective. Mm. We already talked about understanding who the stakeholders are and whom do you need to persuade. Now you need to come in with some credibility. Mm -hmm. How do you show credibility? In part, you show credibility due to perhaps you have had some success before. You can point to certain initiatives that were approved earlier. You hopefully can present some metrics that show that you have succeeded with those objectives, the money was well spent, and thus perhaps the company should give you a chance with your next project. Also, you need to show that you're being careful with the company's money. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? For example, that might mean that you can talk about how what you really wanted originally was to hire five people for a particular project, mm -hmm. but you found a way to do it with two. Mm. Now we're talking about persuasion tactics that are used in sales. Yeah. Oh, this car, I was going to originally sell it to you for $50,000. Yeah. 
I think I'm going to give it to you for 30. Right. And look, we can joke around sleazy sales tactics that we all know to avoid, mm -hmm. but realistically, you want to show the company that you thought this through. You want to show that the reason why you're asking for funding for a particular product, for a particular group of people, is because you have planned this out. You know exactly how the money is going to spend. You want to talk about what it would have looked like had you been less careful, and right. show that what you're asking for is really a good use for the money. Mm -hmm. Also, you need to come into these conversations realizing that, in reality, you don't know the full context. Right. You think that your project is the most important one. It probably is not. Mm -hmm. And whoever <laughs> is looking at the overall budget for the company has a broader understanding and might need to select between three amazing important projects. But if the company only has funding for one of them, that tough decision will need to be made. And I think at some point, if the budget request gets cut, denied, we need to not take it personally. Mm -hmm. Better be for my project. <laughs> yeah, I, I need the budget. I need to keep going. You know, you mentioned sales and also marketing. Mm -hmm. I think that that's where things get very interesting between security and those two departments, especially because with salespeople, you know, they might need to be agile Super and do agile. different techniques and tricks depending on who the audience is. Maybe they need to download a different conferencing software to interact with that team on, you know, wherever they're most comfortable. How do you go about ensuring the success of sales and from a security perspective, but also making sure that they're not putting themselves on undue risk? Mm -hmm. Well, it starts with understanding what do they really do. In many cases, <laughs> yeah. IT and security professionals don't actually know what salespeople do. Very true. Right. We might have in our mind some movie that we saw, <laughs> always be selling, right, yeah. coffee is for closers, <laughs> and we think that that's the world of sales. Yeah. You got to talk to your sales colleagues, mm -hmm. sales leadership, as well as people who are doing the actual selling and understand what does their day look like? What are their needs? We all know that Zoom is a very popular video conferencing solution. Mm. A lot of salespeople like using it, it works well. But with certain clientele, they insist on using Microsoft Teams, for example. Right. What does that mean? If you, as a security and IT team, lock down the person's laptop and they're unable to install Microsoft Teams, guess what? They cannot sell. Mm -hmm. You need to now accommodate another piece of software that maybe is not standard elsewhere in your organization, but you need to understand the business needs and fulfill them. Mm -hmm. So I think it starts with understanding what the needs are and accommodating whichever group you're talking about. Yep. Sales has certain specific requirements because they're in the field. They have to do things on terms that their customers accept. Mm -hmm. R&D, I think, is another group, software engineers, that has their own set of requirements that need to be supported differently. Yeah, I really think Security is a service-centric function, right? We're supporting everyone else to make sure that they can do their function as safely and securely as possible. What are some of the concessions that you find yourself making when it comes to sales? Because sales, they travel around a lot. Maybe they're using public Wi-Fi. You know, you have to make sure that the endpoints are secure. What are some of the things that goes into making sure that they're safe, but they're as flexible as possible? In my experience, Salespeople are easy to work with. Yeah. I don't know why. Maybe I've been lucky. I find that salespeople have a specific set of tools that they use day in and day out. They use those tools. It's deterministic. Mm -hmm. You can ask them, you can interview them, you can observe them, you can understand what tools they use, and you can think about how do you set up those tools so that they're secure, so that they don't expose the organization to undue risk. Mm -hmm. Their workflow, whether it's based on a SaaS application, that you need to configure with certain guardrails in mind, or whether it's based on locally installed software, it's predictable. I mentioned earlier working with software engineers. Mm -hmm. That, I find, is much harder right. because software engineering tends to be, in my experience, a bit less predictable. Working with product can be very difficult sometimes. You have engineers that like to work in their own environments, right? Some organizations go paved road. Like, hey, if you're going to be on the paved road or on a golden path, whatever you want to call it, you have to use these technologies in order to get your stuff approved. So what are some of the things that people should think about when they're having those conversations with the product side of the house? I wish I could tell you that I got it all figured out. <laughs> I got, uh, we, we were hoping for a solution here. I, I, right? I was going to give you a solution, but I have learned along the way of at least what questions to ask and what to strive towards and what to accept as just the reality of things in the world of software engineering. And the reality is things are going to be less predictable than you wish. There's a ton of tools that developers use. 
Nowadays, because so much software development involves open source, there's open source dependencies mm -hmm. that will have to be installed in the development environment, eventually in the production environment. And, and there's just a lot of components coming from different places, different sources, installed in different ways. You also need to understand where the company is in its journey, how mature is it in its thinking about IT and security. I've been at Exonius now for about three and a half years. Mm. And when I started with the company, we were quite small, just, just a, really a handful of people doing things very informally. And the type of security measures that we're implementing now that were much larger, much more mature as an organization, would not have been practical in those days, just because people were still getting even used to the idea that the system that they use for development is not their system, mm -hmm. it's the company's system. Like, like that, that kind of a mindset, it's unfamiliar to a young startup. I mean, imagine you've got a few software engineers together with founders, they have an idea for a product, mm -hmm. they sign up for a bunch of SaaS services, they get themselves uh, access to their favorite cloud infrastructure environment, and they're off using laptops, creating software, deploying it. And then you come in and tell them, stop everything. From now on, I will control every piece of software installed on your laptop. Well, that's not going to be acceptable. Right. So you can gradually add security controls, tighten them over time as the maturity of the organization changes, and you just need to understand what you can do now and accept the fact that it's not going to be perfect. It's not necessarily where you want to be but you have to define it as a journey and work tirelessly towards it over the course of many years. As CISO at Exonius, I'm naturally responsible for our security program. That means building the security program, maturing it, but I'm also responsible for our information technology. So the way that the position at Exonius makes sense is the single person, that is me, responsible for our security program and for our corporate IT and how we use cloud infrastructure that allows me to get pretty good visibility into what's happening within the organization, but of course, create certain challenges <laughs> where sometimes the IT persona in me wants to fight with a security persona. But I think of myself as a security professional because I've been doing security work now for more than two decades. Started out doing system administration, then network administration, got into firewalls, then a bit of software writing. Security has always been fascinating to me because I've always been excited by the idea of protecting, of defending, so I have a defensive mindset. Right. But at some point in my career, I also worked as a consultant running uh, and conducting penetration testing, and mm -hmm. so I had a chance to do some offensive work as well. Security is where so many disciplines within IT, computer science, intersect. You can and should know something a little bit about everything in the world of IT to be successful as a security professional, at least to some extent. Mm -hmm. And then you got to pick the area where you specialize. I have found it hard to specialize in one type of task. Mm -hmm. So at some point I ran a security program, then I switched into consulting to help others build security programs, consulting to help find security flaws and vulnerabilities, then I switched into advising companies how to build uh, cloud infrastructure in a secure way. Then I switched into building products and services that allow companies to secure their own environment, and now I'm back in the role of a CISO running a security program. And as long as my job is related to security, I probably want to do it, but I hope to continue have a chance to take on different functional responsibilities as I evolve and eventually get bored as a professional and then take on some other challenge. My job here is to bring up divisive topics. <laughs> and I think we're getting close to one, bringing in your own environment, bringing in your own software. Now I'm hearing more of a shift about bringing your own device into your corporate network. Mm -hmm. It could save your organization money, it could save them time without having to monitor and find a different solution. What are your thoughts on bring your own device? I think it's tough. It's definitely tougher than having something from a distributor, right? Because then you could have a golden image, everything is nice and perfect and pristine. But when you're bringing in your own device, like, I mean, it just brings on another layer of complexity for configurations, for management, right? It, let's say you're completely set up for Macs, but now you have people that are bringing in Chromebooks and Windows stations, right? It's just bringing an added layer of complexity from my perspective. When you bring your own device, you bring in a lot of vice. 
I just made it up. I don't know, I don't know if it sounds good, but... It's a t-shirt. It's a t-shirt. We'll make it work. <laughs> As Chris said, it's tough. It's tough to not only secure an organization where people are bringing their own devices, it's also tough to provide a reliable IT service to that organization, mm -hmm. where ultimately, what does the employee want? They probably don't care who owns the system. They just want the system to work. They want it to be set up the way that accommodates their workflow. They just want it to be there when they need it. And in some cases, when the organization is still young, a young startup, 10, 20 people, everybody does everything. And in that case, it's easy to say, you know what, you get whatever device you want, expense it to the company, we'll cover the bill, you set it up, that's mm -hmm. fine. And in fact, maybe that's the only way to do it in the very beginning of the company. Mm -hmm. But eventually, once you're beyond 20, 30 people, mm -hmm. you want to have reliable services that are functioning in an expected way, that are secured services that when you put them together, you can provide certain assurances regarding the level of risk that you're taking on, then you gotta manage things centrally. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it's very hard when the device is owned by the employee. Perhaps with a possible exception of a few lightweight workflows, like maybe you will allow, depending on how mature the company is, to uh, conduct certain activities from a personal device. Maybe there's a way to manage an enclave on a device as modern MDM solutions let you do. Right. Uh, the device is untrusted because it's not managed centrally, but some aspect of it is centrally managed. Maybe that's where certain applications can exist. Nowadays, that seems to be a workable solution. I'm of the camp, and this is why this is technically divided. I'm of the camp that bring your own device is a good thing. And I'll, mm -hmm. I'll say why. It's because we are now at our homes more than ever. We're connected mm -hmm. to our own Wi-Fi. It would take nothing for an attacker to just connect to my Wi-Fi home network. It would be a little bit challenging for them to get the password, but after they have the password to my network, they presumably have some level of access to my device, whether it's a work device or a personal device. So from my thinking, the door is already cracked open, especially if I then go to Starbucks and start working at a coffee shop, and I'm working around other people that are doing God knows what on that network. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I mean, that that's one of the benefits of bring your own device, but I do think it it still like makes things a little bit more challenging for security. But like I said earlier, it is a service-centric function, so you kind of have to bend your will just a little bit. And you have phones as well. Yeah, yeah, Mobile phones. Mobile devices. Yeah. I mean, I don't know a lot of people that are using like a corporate phone. There's a lot of people using their own phone <laughs> right. for stuff. So uh, you're definitely right there. When I think about products going out into the world, there's a, a common saying that if you aren't embarrassed by the, the first iteration of your product, you launch too late. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But when you think about it from a security perspective, that sounds scary, right? And so if you're trying to get something out the door, you're trying to meet certain deadlines, sometimes security isn't brought in until a little bit later down the road. Like, oh yeah, we forgot. We're getting ready to get this out the door next week. <laughs> security, can you take a look and make sure everything is good to go? How do we make sure that those two components are, are still being met, where you're meeting your deadlines, but you're still bringing security in in a way that would make it the best possible launch for a product? Well, I think a lot depends on how young or mature the product is. You said in the beginning, the first iteration of the product, you're going to be embarrassed by it. And maybe you're saying that's okay, or maybe even desirable. But there's a difference between being embarrassed and being breached. Right. And I would say that maybe it's okay for us to be a little embarrassed. It's not okay for us to be breached. Unless the product is an alpha version of something that was clearly put together over the last few months. Mm -hmm. You have certain disclaimers to your audience and you say, we're looking for early adopters. Use us at your own risk. I still think that even if a data breach occurs at that early stage, that's not a good thing for the company. Right. But it is more acceptable than a breach happening three years later. Yep. Mm -hmm. And so it's certainly a mistake to start building a product and the first thing that you think about is security. Right. Yeah. Come on, the first thing to think about is whether your product is useful, mm -hmm. where, whether you can stay in existence as a financially responsible business entity, right? What do your customers want? That's what's on the top of your mind. But you also need to think about how do I do it in a secure way? And nowadays, there are frameworks you can use and security architectures where you don't need to recreate everything from scratch. If you adopt certain well-known libraries, frameworks, 
you can build even an initial version of the product right. with reasonable security built in. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's pretty amazing. I know security people like to complain about how bad the world is, but I think nowadays we are so much better off security-wise than we were, let's say, I don't know, a decade ago. You can, if you just think about it, if you put at least a little bit of thought into it, build a reasonably secure first version of your application without talking to a security professional. Mm -hmm. And then as you mature, you grow, you hire more people, your product complexity increases, that's when you start bringing in professional security architects. Mm -hmm. There's so much behind the word breach. And anyone outside of cybersecurity, when they hear that word, they might think breach of contract, mm -hmm. breach of trust. And I think when you have a cybersecurity breach, those are things that happen. In some cases, you're breaching contract, you're breaching trust between your employees or your customers. But sometimes we also break legal obligations to our customers or to the government, to compliance regulatories. What has been your experience between the relationship between security and legal? I've had a very positive relationship with attorneys. And it might be because one of the first jobs, I think the first time I had a chance to build a security program, I was reporting to the general counsel of the company. And it worked out very well because attorneys are generally risk averse. Mm -hmm. And they just think about risks, different risks, not the way security people think about risk, mm -hmm. but they do also think about protecting the company from undue risks. And attorneys that are good are thinking about enabling the company to succeed and allowing business decision makers to make reasonable, informed choices about what risks they're taking from a legal perspective. Mm -hmm. Well, isn't that what security is all about? We want our stakeholders to make informed business decisions. We're there so that they understand what that means, so that they have the information at their fingertips. It's their decision how to proceed. We're there to advise them and to perhaps avoid unnecessary exposure, but it's their decision. And that's how I found business attorneys see their role as well. Mm -hmm. So naturally, I think it's easy for security teams to collaborate with legal teams. Mm -hmm. At least that's been my experience. I love working with the legal team as a security practitioner, especially if we're handling an incident. Unfortunately, there is a certain threshold in which you need to bring legal in to be in the war room to make sure that everything's on the up and up. But uh, I do find that comfort. It's like, oh, okay, good. An adult is here to protect me <laughs> if things go wrong. But I do think people get nervous when legal professionals are brought into operations. And they might not take as many leaps when it comes to handling an incident. Like, oh, maybe we should try this or try that. Maybe they, they kind of constrict their objectives. They might constrict their innovation and thinking and creativity. But I think that's probably a mistake. I think that would enable you to have more creativity. It would enable you to push the boundaries a little bit because you have someone that you can then lean on and answer some of those questions that you have during an incident. And finally, it turns out you found somebody who is even more risk averse than security professionals. Yeah. Right. <laughs> like, usually we're the ones who are coming yeah. in and saying, this is unsafe, stop mm -hmm. it. Right. What you're saying is attorneys get involved and they're telling us during incident response, this is unsafe. I do find it comforting when the legal team is involved because I know that they will educate me about making the right decisions. And in some cases, they will be the ones making the decisions. And that's liberating sometimes. Yeah. And I'm talking about decisions that are very relevant during incident response, such as whom are we supposed to notify about right. the security incident? Mm -hmm. Is this considered to be a data breach? There is specific legal, regulatory, contractual definitions of what it means. Mm -hmm. And it should not be up to the incident responder or the CISO to make those decisions. We right. have seen the risks that CISOs can take onto themselves by also making decisions that really should be with the legal team. Mm -hmm. When legal's involved, I think that it's a little more clear who the adult is in the room, <laughs> right? The legal team, they take precedence. If they yeah. say no, then that really means no. And I think sometimes when security says no, it, it means the same thing to other teams. However, when security is working with security, I think that's where we see a lot of friction. Mm. Application security versus incident response. Who's allowed to do what? Who needs access to what tools? I think both teams would really feel like they need access to everything the light touches, everything that's connected. Because you want to secure everything, but there's also 
other capabilities that security programs have now. I worked with many organizations that have a vulnerability management program. Mm -hmm. They have a GRC program. They have an incident response program. They have an application security program. Mm -hmm. The list keeps going on and on. And then at a certain point, you start to wonder, where does my job start and where does it stop? I think without a very collaborative team, high effectiveness with communication, things will either just not get done or there's extreme turf wars. Mm -hmm. When you talk about communication, I got to look back at you, Lenny, because you write courses on writing and security. A lot of the stuff that we're doing is through chat, email. What are some of the most important things people need to think about when having those communications through writing? We spend a lot of our time writing things, yeah. Whether yeah. we communicate with people on Slack or, or email, and uh, it's very easy for us to communicate poorly but not realize that. For example, we think sometimes that the best way to explain ourselves is to be as thorough as possible, which means you've got, I don't know, an email message that you have to press the scroll down button over, mm -hmm. and, over and over and over and over and over again and we're like, oh, this is great. I'm so proud of that message. It explains everything perfectly. <laughs> and then you're frustrated thinking, well, why, why wasn't it well received? Oh, could it be that nobody cared to read what you had to say? It was just too long. Right. So be short, be brief, be succinct. I said it too many times. I said it so that you know not to do that. Just yeah. say it once and be short about it. Yeah. But sometimes you do need to communicate in length. Sometimes mm -hmm. you really have a lot to say. So the second lesson that I had learned is that you need to understand your audience to communicate in the way that they expect to receive your content. You gotta share your thoughts on their terms. Mm -hmm. And what that means, if you have something lengthy to communicate, think about what's important to the audience and, and start with that, get right. them hooked. If you're communicating with a finance team, probably has something to do with money, mm -hmm. how we're saving money, how we're avoiding unnecessary expenses. Frame it in terms that are important to the reader and you know, be brief. Do it on your reader's terms. And, you know, those are, I think, two reasonable starting points for written communications. Lesson three, do you use emojis? <laughs> do you use emojis? Do it on the reader's terms. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and if you're collaborating with a teenager, <laughs> then you can only use emojis, of course. <laughs> communication is huge. Communication is so important. One of the most important things, especially in security, if someone is leading something like incident response, maybe it's an incident commander, you don't want the first time that you meet an incident commander to be during an incident. You want to build a little bit of a rapport. How do you go about building the relationship with the other heads of the different departments in a business? That, that's so important. And I'm so glad you brought it up into this conversation because if you're interacting with a, with a peer and it's always something about conflict, mm -hmm. then of course it's going to be difficult to, to achieve resolution without too much drama. Mm -hmm. For example, as executives, we often get involved when an escalation happens. When people in our teams collaborate and work together well, things are good. Mm -hmm. And of course, there's always going to be some misunderstanding, some disagreement oftentimes that gets brought up, escalated, and then department heads talk or executives talk. And if that's the only time when you talk, when it's always something tense, something dense, where there's a disagreement, that, that's, that's tough. So as you said, build those relationships mm. in advance. Right. Get to know each other at a human level. And to me right now, it feels like that's less common. It is. Mm -hmm. And that creates certain challenges because then you don't see each other as humans. Mm -hmm, you only right. see each other as a business executive that has a specific objective and you have your own objective and sometimes they're in conflict and you want to push your own through because you, of course, think that you're more important. Yeah. And that's, that's going to be filled with conflict. And working remotely makes it even more difficult. Oh, yeah. Yes. I think it always comes back to empathy, like you were saying, asking genuine questions, getting curious about people's roles and finding where the opportunities are at. You know, sometimes you're, it's not that you're saying no, it's that you're saying yes, but. There is one person in the organization that is hard, very hard to say yes, but to, and that is the CEO. Mm -hmm. If the CEO asks for something, traditionally you want to make sure that it gets fulfilled in as little time as possible. <laughs> and I think it could be hard for many people to build a relationship with their CEO. One, they're running the business, so you want to make sure that they're taken care of, but Two, it might be a slightly intimidating to speak to your CEO, even from a person-to-person -person level. How have you seen it done in organizations, and what are some of your tactics for 
building a good relationship where you could say yes, but with confidence? I think, first of all, just like when you communicate with any executive, how do you persuade them to pay attention to you? Mm -hmm. It takes a bit of time to build goodwill. When they just hired you, you have a, maybe a two-month period where people are just willing to give you some space. Mm -hmm. And they're going to give you the benefit of the doubt because they figure you were probably hired for a reason. Yeah. They're going to let you do your thing, and your peers, and perhaps the CEO, is going to be attentive to what mm -hmm. you have to say. But at some point, you've got to start showing the value. Yep. And if you, after months and months of work, after years of work, have shown that your advice is sound, that your leadership is to be trusted, then of course, no matter whether you talk to your boss or to your peers, they will pay attention. But when it comes to the CEO, ultimately, the CEO will make decisions that they think are right, mm -hmm. and they have more visibility than any of the other executives into what's happening in the company, and ultimately, they will own their decision. My job is to make sure that the decision is informed. Mm -hmm. Some folks call it risk acceptance. Some folks call it risk awareness. When you have to bubble up this decision to the CEO and say, look, this is the situation, you have to make a call on it. What are some of the best practices you've seen for executives to have that conversation with the CEO of saying, hey, this is the situation, are we going to accept this risk or not? You have to communicate on their terms. You want to make sure that they understand the decision. Now, first of all, it takes some educating to explain to others that it really is their decision. Right. It's not my decision. All right. Let's say a business decision maker is interested in doing business with a young, exciting startup. It's a young organization, only 10 people. As a security professional, you're worried about the maturity of their security program. Right. And it's safer to not do business with that organization. Because right away, in your mind, you're thinking about all the ways in which things can go wrong. But it's not your decision. You can weigh in, you should provide input, but ultimately, you need to explain to the business decision maker what are the potential negative effects of taking on this risk. Because what's on their mind is things that are very positive, right? They right away look at that exciting new startup and they think about all the ways in which it'll help their business. That's what they think about. Mm -hmm. And one way to be heard is to first of all acknowledge that you see the upside. You understand why they want to do business. Mm -hmm. They want to be understood and you need to put effort into making sure that you understand mm -hmm. why they want to do this. Then you, you need to explain the risk without using technical terms that you think they might not understand, but at the same time, not talking down to them. Right. But ultimately, you need to make sure that they understand that it's their decision. But I also want to bring up the need to understand what kind of relationship do you have with those individuals. Mm -hmm. And the relationship is going to be different based on their personalities, their experience, your shared experiences with them. Mm -hmm. There was an article that I read in Harvard Business Review that gave me the framework to evaluate relationships among people in a business context. In that article, the researchers talked about classifying a relationship on a scale that ranged from conflict on the one end of the spectrum to collaboration on the other. Mm. And you need to think about the stages of a relationship, between what's between conflict and collaboration. Mm -hmm. In that framework, there were five stages in that framework. It started with conflict, then competition, then independence, then cooperation, and ultimately collaboration. Mm. Now, when you're talking about someone with whom you actually have a conflict, you can think of them as your enemy. That's a very bad place to be, but sometimes, let's face it, maybe we have to deal with such situations. You want to think about how do you change that relationship all the way into where you're fully engaged and collaborating and supporting each other. Mm -hmm. You need to look at the relationship between you and the other executives, and not publicly, to yourself. Yeah. Think, where are you on that spectrum that I just described? Mm -hmm. Because depending on the nature of your relationship, depending on where you are, you might need to interact with them in a different way, and of course, think about moving that relationship towards collaboration. Mm -hmm. I thought that was an interesting way to think about relationships because the existence of this framework recognizes that people interact differently, and sometimes some of your colleagues are more supportive than others, and uh, you work with them differently. 
Yeah, and it seems like you would have to kind of go up the scale. You can't just go from conflict straight to collaboration. Like, let's do a project together. Like, yes. I'm not working with That's you. Right. Are you kidding me? <laughs> yeah, it's just, there's just no way to, to jump stages. That's right, yeah. Right. Now, the, in the middle, the middle stage in that framework is independence. Mm -hmm. uh, think of it as peaceful coexistence. Right. We're just neighbors. Each yeah. one doing our own thing, minding our own business. Mm -hmm. That's a neutral, not an unreasonable state to be in mm. until you realize that you sometimes do need to collaborate and you want to do it on positive terms, and that's when you really want to move towards uh, cooperation and collaboration. You've been very successful because little do people know, you also write books and still teach courses today, and I know that you still dabble with reverse engineering. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I used to write books. <laughs> I, I don't know, maybe someday when I retire, I'll, I'll, I'll write a memoir. But I had been teaching security classes with Sands Institute now for many years. Mm -hmm. And I love educating. I learn things and then I'm afraid that I will forget them if I don't use them, if I don't use those skills every single day. Mm -hmm. And my way of making it harder for me to forget those skills is to educate others right. about what it is that I have just learned because that forces me to get to know the topic really, really well. And so at some point when I was doing incident response, I stumbled into the field within security that has to do with malware analysis and reverse engineering malware. Mm -hmm. And so I created a course on how to analyze malware because it's something that I had to learn for myself and I was afraid that I'm going to forget how to do it. So I created a course at SANS and I continued to teach it. Mm -hmm. So I used to be able to deploy a firewall, mm -hmm. harden the configuration of a host, write software, respond to an incident, do forensic analysis, and, and all that stuff. And it's wonderful. I cannot do most of those things anymore. I can do other things, right. like act as an executive, make business decisions, collaborate with others. Work a spreadsheet. Work a spreadsheet, <laughs> gosh, you have, to, you have to be a spreadsheet expert. So what I decided to do is to hang on to one skill set in a technical, hands-on way, and for me that was malware analysis. Mm. And I thought it'll be okay for me to give up other hands-on technical skills as long as I have at least one skill that helps me stay grounded. And for me, that's been our analysis. I continue to do it now mostly as a hobby, and I teach courses at SANS on that topic. You know, when we first got started in this conversation, I thought it was really gonna feel like security versus everybody. Because that's how I felt most of my career, honestly. But what I'm hearing, especially from you, Lenny, is that it's security for everyone. Build relationships, get to know people, and I think, you know, flipping it on its head, there's a lot of questions that people may ask security or should ask security. What are some of those questions that you think executives, like your peers, should be asking you about security? The thing is, they shouldn't be asking me any security questions. <laughs> They've got their business objectives. They're good at what they do, presumably, and they should be going about doing their business, and they should feel supported by me and my team. They should know that we've got their back. They should know that when they want advice on risk, on certain implementations, on deployments, that we will be there to support them, but I cannot make them come to me. I need to, through continuous engagement, provide value so that they pull me into discussions. Mm -hmm. I'd love it if they were to talk to me about you know, all the greatest ways in which phishing campaigns work nowadays, and, and I can geek out and talk about that, but they shouldn't have to ask those questions. We as security professionals should provide our guidance, define certain guardrails, so that people can go around their business while knowing that as long as they stay within the framework that we have defined for them, they will be able to do it without exposing the company to unexpected risks. I want to ask you both, if you had to think of one word that you would want to give to the leader, to the people that are working on a security team, what is that one word that they should keep in their mind as a mantra when they're having these conversations, when they're operating with all these different business units? For me, I would have to say that word would be balance because you don't want to over-index on serving them because you got to keep things safe. You don't want to pester them too much because you still want to have time to do your own stuff. You don't want to push them too far into the collaboration point because you might scare them away. So it's all about really balancing the relationship, balancing your place in the organization. I think that's probably one of the most important things. What about you all? My word would have to be curiosity 
to ask questions from a curious place. A lot of the times it almost feels like the questions that you get in the workplace are stump the chump. They're asking mm. because, you know, did you think of this? But right. not asking to see if there's an opportunity for me to help. I think especially for security, curiosity could lead to so much. Those are great words, yeah. Uh, the word that comes to my mind is empathy. Mm. You need to really understand where the other person is coming from. The phrase that I hear sometimes is that when we go about our lives, we're always the main character in our movie. Yeah. <laughs> we always see everybody else as the supporting actor. Yeah, mm -hmm. 100%. But the reality is that everybody else thinks that they're the main character. <laughs> and whether we like it or not, security professionals in most cases are the supporting actors. Mm -hmm. We're there to enable other business teams to succeed. And for us to be successful at protecting the organization, we need to understand what the other people are thinking about. Mm -hmm. Now, we cannot always say yes. We have to say yes, but perhaps, or we need to inform. Sometimes it really is our job to say, this is just crazy, but in a way that makes people feel loved and supported. But if we understand where the other person is coming from, then we can be more collaborative, more supportive. If we understand that the reason for their request is not because they're trying to be difficult, but because they're under some enormous deadline to deploy something tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Like, if we understand this, then we're less likely to be personally offended. We're less likely to be angry. And we're more likely to start thinking creatively about how to support the request that allows you to do your job, which is to protect the organization, to avoid unnecessary risks, while also supporting the other person. Mm -hmm. That's it. Empathy, knowing that you're not the only person in the room, understanding the plight of the other person, curiosity, being genuinely curious about, oh, why would we make this decision? Just really wanting to understand. And then obviously balance because we want to definitely keep homeostasis within an organization. We don't want to ruffle feathers. We want to be collaborative. Sure, we're going to have tough conversations from time to time, but it's all about growth at the end of the day. And you said it perfectly, it's not security versus everyone, it's security for everyone. We're all one team, one fight, so let's get it done. Cheers to that. Cheers to that.